There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, serve, learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC. There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, serve, learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. 
And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC. Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Harrisburg United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here. And if you're visiting with us online and watching from online, let us know by liking uh, our, uh, the video and uh, making a comment or two. It's great to see everyone back after uh, a long week for some of us who have spring break and all that kind of stuff. And it's been a lot of fun. And uh, back, to, back at it at uh, you know, back to normal next week, you know. So uh, Easter's one of those things where it's, we, we kind of get absorbed in everything else and we miss what happens next. And so this morning, as we gather for worship, Pastor Frederick's going to bring a message on what happened next. A lot of us like, okay, Easter's done. See, we put away our Easter eggs and our nice little outfits and then we go away. And so now it's time for uh, what's next. And if you read the scriptures, it's time to get to work, folks. It's time to live out what Jesus died for and for us to be a part of, of his work here in this place. So uh, looking forward to some, some, great, um, some great days coming up. As far as that's concerned, that leads me into my announcements because there's a lot going on already. Next Saturday night, we are having a Get to Know You event, and it's an RSVP event, so we know how many people are coming. You can call the church office and let us know. I believe there's sign-ups in the email that we send out weekly. Also, uh, next Sunday at 10 o'clock during the Sunday school hour, we're going to have a breakfast for everyone. Uh, inviting everybody to come have conversation. There'll be stuff for children and everything else. So um, it'll be a good time for fellowship and get to know each other and kind of focus on how we can strengthen our Sunday school. Uh, and that's next Sunday. And then 3.30 in the afternoon, we'll have our master builders for our children who are ages uh, five through fifth grade um, at 3.30. So that's another fun time. They're going to do a project for Earth Day. So uh, if you have grandchildren or children that age group, we really need them because we're going to make 30-something plantings to uh, take out to um, our, some of our shut-ins in our church. Um, so it'll be a fun afternoon. And our last one is, uh, there is our annual uh, Rise Against Hunger event where we pack meals uh, for folks who that will go overseas or go to where there's a natural disaster. And we're turning that into a big, huge event that day. And it is May the 6th. You'll need to sign up um, online. Uh, the, I think the link went out this Friday and also it's on the Facebook page. Uh, you'll go to Rise Against His web website and you'll sign in and it gives a uh, um, <clears throat> permission to work and all that kind of stuff to be here. And so it's going to be a fun day. We're going to have bounce houses for children, games outside. Uh, hot dogs, all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be more than just, and also an emphasis on our own food pantry here in Harrisburg. So we'll ask everybody to bring some canned goods to go to the food pantry, come in, pack meals, and then come and enjoy a day of fellowship and fun. And the whole community is invited. So it might be a good way to bring a neighbor and find someone who likes to serve to come and be a part of, of that big event. So make sure that's on your calendars. So this morning, as we gather for worship, I encourage you to take a deep breath Focus your mind and your heart on Christ. And we're going solo this morning. We have Dan, the man, to lead us uh, in our worship. So would you stand and join us for our first song this morning? There's, there's no Patty on guitar. There, there's no Leo on keys. You just got me some tracks. So I expect everybody to help me out by stepping up, singing loud. If I don't hear you, I can hear everyone. I got a mic here. I can bring you up. You can come join me. When confusion's my companion and despair holds me for ransom, I will feel no I know that you are near When I'm far deep in the valley With chaos for my company I'll find my comfort here Cause I know that you are
I invite you to greet your neighbor and pass the peace and welcome each other to their worship this morning. I invite everyone to be seated. If, <clears throat> Relationships in, in our community are so important. Um, church is family, and we've got to stick together as family to build each other up and be there for one another and to, and to be with each other through the good times and the bad times. So in the mornings, you know, it's always so good to hear folks greet each other and the conversations that goes on and making sure that new folks who are wandering in our in our midst are welcomed and loved and made sure to feel that that they are part of our of our family whether they come back or not but they're more likely to come if they know that they're loved and welcomed so um, the conversation is really good and so I just encourage you that and if there's somebody you don't know their name go up there and ask them their name um, say I mean if somebody asks me my name, I'm not ever offended. Usually I tell them, make up a name or something, but, um, but it's okay because I am the worst when it comes to remembering names and things like that, especially on spur of the moment. I'll be up here. I've known somebody for 20 years and I was like, what, what, you know, and, oh yeah, Frederick. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, happens to me all the time. I don't know what it is. So please don't be offended, but I think knowing each other is so, so critical, especially in this day and time. And with that said, um, I invite you to um, think about what you would offer God this week as we move to our offering in our time of prayer. Um, one practice that we've been doing every week in Sunday school with our young people is that we take about 10 minutes and we ask each other where we saw God this week. And sometimes it's in the behavior of, a, of the horse was better this week. Uh, sometimes it's in a friend who did something for us uh, unexpectedly. And so what I want you to think about is where did you see God this week? Where did you notice God working in your life? Where was that blessing? And we need to, if we could do that daily, it just changes our whole way of thinking and looking at the world because God is in the midst of us. He is the risen Christ and he's here to love us and to engage with us. So this week you're offering maybe every day, think about where did I see God today and share that with someone close to you. So will you join me in prayer? Lord, we give you thanks for all that you do in our lives, Lord. You are an amazing God. We sometimes, because of how things are timed, we kind of miss the power that the Easter event brings. You raised Jesus from the dead and he has defeated death and lives once again in this world and in all of us. And there's something incredibly humbling and powerful about that. So this morning as we recover from our spring breaks and, and all of that we've done, help us to remember that you are part of that. We want to go back to the life as it was. It's hard to change and it's hard for us to move forward. So God, help us to see your presence in this place. Help us to be motivated to do those things that you called us to do, not to sit back, but to go out and to love our neighbors, to walk with those who are hurting, to add support to someone who needs whatever it is they need, Lord. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus. I mean, it is him that we distrust and we rest our lives on. He is our hope. He is our joy. And most of all, he is our love. So God, continue to build that love and that, that sense of purpose in our lives. Lord, we thank you so much for what you're doing in the life of our church. And we know that there are numerous folks in this church who are struggling with personal things. There are... I can count 10 people in this church who are dealing with cancer. I know that some of us have lost loved ones recently. There's been celebration of new life with some of our folks having children and adding blessing to the world. So it's, there's just so much going on. And Lord, we ask that you be with everyone in those places. 
whether they are rejoicing or whether they're in the pits of darkness and sorrow. God, we ask for your presence to shine your light and draw us closer to you and closer to one another. Lord, we look out in our world and we see such anger and confusion. We look at people being hurt and killed all the day long. Senseless things that have happened like in Louisville last week. And Lord, we don't know how to answer that individually, but Lord, as a people together, we can come up with better solutions for our lives and our country. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be creative in those things as well as in the personal things. Help us to live into your presence. Unite us and may we be one voice singing your praise and your love. And Lord, may that prayer that you taught us in the New Testament in the book of Matthew be our call. Our Lord, um, our Father, <laughs> see, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand and our children who are ages three through the first grade are welcome to go with Miss Michelle to Children's Church. So please stand and join us for our next song.
Thank you, Dan, for giving our music this morning. Sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. <laughs> Grace and peace to each and every one of you. From God the Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as Rich, Richard mentioned earlier, for the next few Sundays, we will deal with a uh, sermon series titled Living After Easter. We have something in common that uh, the disciples did the same thing after uh, they watched uh, Jesus be crucified. They sort of took off and went AWOL. And I have to learn that coming back into the church, I pastored for over 20 years preaching in the church and then these three years on conference staff, but to get back into the church, people take a break after Easter also, so it's still the norm. So I'm used to that. But I want to talk about this one, the morning after, but if you want to read ahead and Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we're going to talk about preaching to strangers. Next Sunday, the good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. And then after that, we have started to have a sermon starting over in John chapter 21. So if you want to read ahead, and I will put those out on Facebook because I think it's a, a time when we really sort of tune into who we are after Easter. And sometimes we seem to forget that our Savior rose. He's not, he's, he's not on that cross anymore. Grace and peace to each and every one of you. I'm Frederick Bowman, the pastor of this church. I so humbly serve and so pleasure to be here this morning of all times because I was sharing with them when I came in. I thought it was raining outside. I woke up at 5 o'clock. I thought it was raining outside, and I got up, and I was disappointed. So, but it's all good. Will you please stand with me as we look at the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Very familiar uh, text. Uh, John penned these words by saying, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. And just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in, haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had taken it off and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. You, God. you may be seated. I solicit your prayers as we talk about this morning, the morning after. Yeah, the morning after. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, it is during this time of your worship that your servant prayed to send your anointing that makes preaching easy. Hide me behind the cross that your people see less of me and more of thee. And I always pray when it's all said and done, let them see none of me and all of thee. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Now, Lord, the word is yours. The spirit is yours, and we are yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. 
Many of you could remember one of the most devastating storms or events in our life in 2005 as Hurricane Katrina. It left an impression on everyone there that destroyed a lot of things. And I was watching a PBS documentary hosted by Tavis Smiley. And the title of his documentary was The Right to Return Home. And the young man was articulating his story so well when he mentioned about the fact he tried to get the, his family to go with him. The day was sunny. It was bright. It was not expected. But they was monitoring the weather as it was preparing to come to New Orleans. The young man said he went to get a rental car because he knew that his evacuation had to be done. But when he got back, some of the family members did not want to go. His mother did not want to go. But his brother decided to stay also, so as a few of them stayed in the house, even though the catastrophe of the storm was looking real, real shady. You could see in his voice he was trembling as he heard the report afterwards. So he left and evacuated out of town. He was more concerned about the eye of the storm. The eye of the storm had not reached New Orleans yet. So he was able to take the pack up his family with his friends and his children and left his brother and mother right there. It's an astonishing story of those who refuse to leave. But they take the guy after the storm who stayed with his mother. He said that night they were sitting in the house cuddled up. And all of a sudden, they heard the rain and the wind coming up against the house. And he said, it's been to turn dark. You could not even see the front of your hand. But he said, one thing that happened was, was that in New Orleans, most of them in that area, which is always in the Ninth Ward, the Lower Ninth Ward, they always kept the ax in the attic. They were used to these warnings. But then again, the levee broke. All that water, they say the total of it probably about 98 to $145 billion for damage. Fatalities were 1392. And this couple, mother and son, survived the storm. He told the story about how he used the ax to chop a hole because he knew the water level was coming up. And to stand on that, sit on that rooftop through all this pitch darkness, it had to be scary. Darkness has a way of doing that to us when we can't see our way. But then they wait for the sun to come up the next day, praying that they will survive. Harrisburg, midnight represents this dark and despondent experience that even every child of God must go through it sometime. It doesn't matter how pretty the day may be. It could be sunny outside and the birds are chirping, but there are times when it's sunny outside, but in our hearts and in our minds it's dark. I can only imagine many situations and circumstances that we go through in life. It's the same way with midnight for every believer. It can be a daylight, but our hearts are troubled. It can be daylight, but yet our cloud of darkness is over us. What are you trying to say here? All of us at time in our lives have encounter a different kind of midnight. Midnight can be that unfavorable news that we receive that we wasn't expecting. Midnight can be that financial situation that seemed to be in order, but all of a sudden is destitute. Midnight could be that relationship of a marriage or a relationship that just severs after so many years. Midnight. When we don't know what to do and don't know where to go, don't know what to say, life will deal us some midnights. Am I in the house this morning? If you haven't experienced it, keep on living. Because the day will come. How do we deal with our midnights? 
But we have a person by the name of Jesus who was able to do more than we could think of, who can identify with our midnight when we're going through a crisis. Now, the disciples decide to go fishing. It's common to go do something that you're used to doing when your world is turned upside down. I guess they're trying to find some rationale. So they say, I'm going fishing. Peter, the leader, the, I'm going fishing. They say, I'm going to. It's about seven or eight of them now. So they went fishing. Go back to the old territory, the old landmark, business as usual. But did not Jesus tell them to go in Galilee? And they was round the Sea of Galilee. They were there for a reason, but not for fishing. And here Jesus shows up. And if you look at this text real closely here, you'll find out the apostles were doing what they normally know what to do. But what do you do when the crisis, when your world is turned upside down? And you're looking for Jesus in all the corners of the world, but yet he don't seem to show up. John has given us a pretty good story here because John, the only one who tells us this story out of the Gospels. But how will you tell us this story? The last few days have been like a roller coaster. They had Palm Sunday and then they had uh, Good Friday and then all of a sudden have the crucifixion. And we too must be careful. We've just went through programs and the Easter egg hunt and all these things, Lent, and yet what do we do now? We have to do what the disciples were told to do. But they went fishing. And we too sometimes go back and do the same thing we've been doing. And God is stepping up his battles for us to do even more. Why is that so important? Seven of them involved. Andrew and Philip. The Galilee seven. Fishing. Peter the instigator. The initiator brought them all out there, fished all night long, but the Bible said they didn't catch nothing. These are skilled fishermen, but they went out and caught nothing. Night, midnight was the best time for fishing, and yet they came up empty. And many times we come up empty when we think we're doing what we're supposed to do, and God has better and greater plans for us. I could confess, I feel like Peter sometimes, particularly in this situation, when God is trying to navigate you here and we go just opposite. They didn't understand this. This was a spiritual journey now. Here we have the resurrected Christ who's going to come to them and they don't even recognize him. And sometimes we could get so caught up in ourselves that we sometimes don't even recognize God when he comes to church. He does come to church, I do believe. And sometimes we act like he didn't do nothing in our life all week long. So we can identify with them. Mary didn't recognize him. The two on the walk to Emmaus didn't recognize him. Here the disciples, the inner circle and all, who've been around him, they don't even recognize him. But Jesus, who's gracious, who loves us so much that he gives us a little grace. Look how the text unfold. First of all, that night they caught nothing. So Jesus, first of all, realized that they failed. Here they are trying to catch what they normally do, and at the break of the day, they had nothing to ask for. These are skilled fishing. But that day, and you know the story. And Jesus reminded them, cast it on the other side. But check how Jesus navigated through this. First of all, he led them to a confession. He told them, he said, children, do you have, do you catch anything? Do you have order for us to eat? And their response was no. He wanted them to confess that they were not listening to him. And I do believe in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, they say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. He wanted a confession, a confession out of them. And, be, and we must be aware of the misrepresentation that we do when we talk to God. He knows what's going on in our hearts. 
We can't fool him. We can fool people, but we can't fool God. So he led him to a confession. Then he turned around and tested their faith. Now, if I'm tired, Jesus, I mean, I've been fishing all night. I smell like fish. I haven't seen my wife in a week or so. What you? He said, cast it on the other side. Now, imagine they said, no, we're not going to do it. We're fishermen. We know what we do. And sometimes we could get bullheaded. And as I mentioned in a sermon a year or months ago, Jesus didn't change the waters. He didn't change the fish. He didn't change the nets. It was the same place, but they had to take it for his word to cast the net on the right side. Jesus will test our faith when we're going through our darkest moments. After we confess, even if we come short of the mark, he will test our faith. But he's so gracious and kind. And somebody needs to hear that this morning. He also will allow us to turn our failures into success just to glorify him. I can just imagine those two sitting on that rooftop all night long praying that God will move in a mighty way. Can you remember the blessing of the sun rising up by the time the, the morning came and they looked? We are safe. God took care of us all night long. And he did the same with the fishermen. He turned their failure into success. And then he pushed it a little further. He provided them what they want. Now here they are. Jesus show up. They don't recognize him. He's having a conversation with them and he's so generous he decided to start a fish fry before they even got there. Did that what the Bible say? He had the coals going on. Then he had to bring the charcoal. That's how gracious he is. That's how much he loves us and he provides for our wants. No matter how dark and dreary our days are, there's always him providing our wants. Can you imagine that fish frying when they got the shore? They say he got so happy that Peter put on his outer garments. He's out there fishing without a shirt on. He put on his outer, outer garments and swam to the shore. Because if anybody had some time to make up, it was Peter. And all of us are like Peter. We would probably jump in and swim also. And then the disciples rolled the boat in. But then the blessing, Jesus sit there and fellowship with them. Can you imagine their eyes still trying to figure this thing out? But this is the nugget. They knew he who he was, but they did not want to act. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I know that. I I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying they did not want to ask who he was. But they knew who he was. And he sitting there fellowshipping with them, having a good time with the fish. I'm going to tell you something, Harrisburg. We cannot conceive what those people went through in 2005 in New Orleans during that midnight hour. And even each one of us, individually and collectively sometimes, we ask the question, how are we going to make it through the night? We will have more midnights. But we must learn that the God we serve will help us reclaim our mornings. I do believe that's why I say joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night. But out of many times, we give up on God when our darkest moments when he's standing there big, waiting to have a fish fry and a fellowship with us. And when he's brought you through some dark moments, and I look back over my life, some things I couldn't get myself out of, and you can also. You must understand, when he bring you out of something, can you imagine the excitement of the disciples around there, having a fish fry, having a good time? Morning has broke. They are no longer satisfied with survival. They're hungry for a revival. And when you claim your mornings, there's no longer us and them. It's but it's Jesus coming. It's no longer who I am, but whom I am. When he bring you through. You no longer I've been, but yet where am I going? Because he has his hands in it. And it's not about out of the way. But when you come through some situations and circumstances, 
You're telling somebody you're showing somebody the way. And I'm so glad when we get at the end of our journey, when our life don't exist on this side anymore. I can say I've been fishing all night. And when I stand before the master, I want to be able to say, but thank God I caught something. Fishermen or men, your situations and circumstances you go through is to build you up and to pass on to someone else. How you know God is powerful if you never tried him? How you know he's not able unless you're willing? And when you have fished all night and haven't caught anything, God steps in. To God be all the glory. Whatever you're going through this morning, midnight be here. But the morning when God steps in. Somebody who is listening by Facebook or social media, you may have had a restless night. But thank God God send you another day to bless him and to praise him. That's why we're here. Easter's over, but he's still calling us to greater things. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the people of God say amen. Every now and then, if you stand as we get ready for our last song, please stand. Don't let this world rob your joy. We're going to have to go through some things. Midnight will come. But we trust the one who controls the midnight. Dark times will come, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And when you dust yourself off, wash your face, brush your teeth, and go out in a new day, thank God for that day. Because he's worthy. Well, I'm just getting wound up now. <laughs> he's worthy to be praised. My wife and I spent our 20th anniversary yesterday. A year ago, I didn't think we were making it. Midnight is when you trust God the most. The joy will come in the morning. Thank you, Lisa.
merciful and all wise God is always remind us that life was a journey, not a destination. And there will be some midnights in our lives as we go through this fallen world. But thank God that you are the author and the finish of our faith. And you know how to touch the innermost parts of us that no human hands can touch. No matter what someone's going through last night, we pray, oh God, that you touch the innermost spirit and let them know that you're present with them. But we have a new day. And let's be mindful. It's not because we've been so good, but all because of your grace. Now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of us as we part from this place, but Lord, never from your presence. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, let the people of God say, amen. amen. There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, week, serve, okay? learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC.